was 1971 when Edwin Robinson found himself in a traffic accident, and it was that accident that left him blind and partially deaf. For nine years, Robinson learned how to live with those difficult disabilities. That is, until another freak accident occurred. This took place during a thunderstorm that happened back in 1980. It was then there in 1980 when Robinson stepped out into the thunderstorm. Why, you might ask? Well, he wanted to retrieve his pet chicken. He really loved that chicken. And he was willing to risk going out into that storm in order to to protect his chicken. And and it was there in his front yard where the 62-year-old was struck by a lightning bolt. And it knocked him to the ground. And after coming to his senses, Robinson rejoiced because he realized that the lightning strike had restored his sight. As a man of faith, Robinson was quick to give God all the glory for the way that the Lord had used that lightning bolt to restore his sight. What an incredible story. And if you think this story is incredible, you'll be excited to know that the Bible actually has several stories about the way in which the Lord Jesus restored the sight of the blind. We're going to consider three of these stories here in our study today. And we're going to see how the Lord Jesus is able to restore sight to the blind. And as we consider these stories about the way that the Lord restored the the, the sense of sight for these blind people, we're also going going to consider the, the fact that every person is born spiritually blind. We might be born with a sense of sight, but we're all born spiritually blind. And, and, and here's the good news is that the Lord Jesus is able to restore our spiritual sight. With this as our focus, it'll help us to understand, first of all, that our spiritual sight is restored by the light of the Lord. Secondly, we'll learn that our spiritual sight is restored by our faith in the Lord. Thirdly, and finally, we'll learn that our spiritual sight is restored by the word of the Lord. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 9. It's here where we find the Lord Jesus restoring the sight of a blind man. And as you make your way to the ninth chapter of John's gospel account, I want to take a moment to remind you that God the Father, he sent his only begotten son to present the poor with the good news of grace. Not only that, but Jesus was also sent to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to those who are in bondage. And furthermore, he was also sent to restore the sight of the blind. This is one thing that we know about the Messiah, that he would restore the sight of the blind. And it's here in the Gospel of John where we find the Lord Jesus. He's fulfilling this promise as he restored the sight of a blind man who had been born blind. But this has the focus. If you would look with me here at John chapter 9, I want to begin reading at verse 1. Here John writes, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And as his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus restoring the sight of this man who had been born blind. But now, before we consider this incredible miracle, we, we must not fail to grasp the question that the disciples posed here in this text as they ask, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now listen, this is what we would call a loaded question. In other words, it's a trick question, which includes an unverified assumption. Uh, for example, uh, uh, you, might, uh, uh, you might think about loaded questions in this way. If somebody were to, were to come to you and ask you, you know, have you stopped beating puppies yet? That's a loaded question. The question is preloaded with an accusation that you once beat puppies, and now we just want to know if you've stopped beating those puppies. You, know, you haven't yet proven that this person has beat puppies in the past, right? Chances are you don't beat puppies. At least I hope you don't beat puppies. I don't know. I don't know your life. I don't know what's going on. 
But if I were to ask you if you stopped beating puppies, it's, it's an accusation that you used to at least. It's loaded. With this in mind, let's take another look at, it, at this loaded question, uh, which is found there in the middle of verse 2. There the disciples of Christ declare, Rabbi, who sinned? It's not did anybody sin, but it's somebody sinned, clearly. Who did it? Who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. You see how they preloaded the question with an unfounded accusation? They assumed at the outset that the birth defect that resulted in the blindness of this man was a punishment that the Lord was pouring out on this family because obviously someone sinned. This loaded question was also based on a false dichotomy that the congenital blindness of this man was either caused by the parents or the, the child uh, you know, himself. Was it the parent you know, that, that sinned? Or maybe you know, that baby when it was in the womb you know, maybe the baby in the womb sinned, and therefore he was born blind. Now, as we continue to consider the loaded question of these disciples, it's important for us to understand that birth defects are not a punishment of the Lord. That's what these guys were thinking, that this birth defect, this blindness, it must be a punishment of God. Trust me when I tell you that birth defects are not a punishment of the Lord. No, instead, the Lord is the one who creates these conditions and always for the benefit of the individual. It might be hard to imagine, but there are times when the Lord will allow someone to suffer a birth defect or, or maybe a, a situation later on in life for their own good. Please trust me when I tell you that the Lord loves every single person and wants to give them the very best opportunity to come to faith in Jesus Christ. He's less concerned about how comfortable we are in this life and more concerned that we come to faith in Jesus Christ so that we can be saved. And the Lord knows that if, if it takes blindness from birth for someone to come to faith in him, that that's what he's going to do so that they might be saved. In order to prove my point, I would remind you of something that the Lord said in Exodus chapter 4. There he asks, who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, why would the Lord make a blind eye? Why would the Lord make a deaf ear if not for the good of the individual so that they might be saved? With all this in mind, let's turn our attention now back to John chapter 9. If you would look with me here at verse 3. Here the Lord Jesus is answering the loaded question of his disciples, and he answers in this way. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. God created this man blind so that the works of the Lord could be revealed in the way that he was healed. The perceived defect that resulted in the blindness of that man, it wasn't caused by the punishment of God. No, instead, God created the man with congenital blindness so that the miraculous power of the Lord could be revealed in his healing. The Lord had a plan to use the blindness of that man in order to reveal the miraculous ministry of our Messiah so that others might be saved as well. And while the powerful work of the Lord was revealed as he enabled that man to see, we must not fail to grasp the spiritual truth that the Lord was also uh, presenting uh, before healing this blind man. And with this as the focus, let's uh, back up and look again at John chapter 9. I want to draw your attention back to verse 4. Here Jesus declares, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus, he's actually interrupting this miracle. You know, they come across this blind man and the disciples are like, hey, who sinned? And Jesus says, oh, before I do this miracle, I, I want you to understand something here. He's interrupting this miracle so that he could help his disciples grasp uh, an even greater truth. And in order to grasp the point that the Lord was making, we should take a moment to consider the spiritual truth that he's revealing. Notice again there in the middle of verse 5, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. Now, as we consider this statement, we can be certain that Jesus was clearly speaking metaphorically. In other words, the Lord Jesus isn't literally the light of the world. The sun is the light of the world, right? Right? The sun that, 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 you know, 
that illuminates our, our, our earth. You know, that, that's the light of the world. But Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It's important to understand that he's speaking of a spiritual light. He is the spiritual light of the world. You might not know this, but this is actually one of seven I am statements that Jesus makes, each of which were designed to help us to understand the miracle of our Messiah. As a matter of fact, Jesus not only de declared, I am the light of the world, but he also declared, I am the bread of life. Sounds delicious. Is he speaking literally or spiritually? He says, I am the door. I am the good shepherd, he says. I am the resurrection and the life. Furthermore, Jesus also declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and he says this, I am the true vine. Now, as we consider these seven I am statements of Jesus, I'm sure we all recognize Jesus is not a literal vine. Of course not. He isn't a literal door. He isn't a literal loaf of bread. Now, when Jesus claimed to be these things, he's speaking metaphorically, and he's trying to help us to understand more about his ministry. When Jesus claimed to be the light of the world, he's trying to help us to understand that he is the one who provides us with the spiritual illumination that we need so that we can see the truth. And with this as the focus, let's consider the way that Jesus puts it here in John chapter 8. Uh, I want to draw your attention to John chapter 8, verse 12. It's there where Jesus declared, I am the light of the world he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He's talking about the light of life. That word light was well, translated from a Greek word, which was used in reference to any source of illumination. Light, it's a natural agent that stimulates sight and makes things visible. And, and just to, you know, further grasp this, just imagine the, the, the time that you've walked into a dark room. You know, there's no source of light. There's no windows. There's no light coming in. The light is turned off. And you can't see anything, right? When you walk into a dark room and there's no source of light, you, you can't see anything. You might have perfect vision. You might have 20-20 vision. But without a source of light, you might as well be blind. Because without light, your eyes that might work perfectly can't see anything. What this means is that we not only need eyes that can see, but there must also be a source of light that illuminates our surroundings. It's in a similar yet a spiritual way that there must be a source of spiritual light so that we can see through the darkness of this wicked world. Without a spiritual source of light, we would all find ourselves trapped in the darkness that results in our own spiritual blindness. Thankfully for us, the Lord Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the spiritual light that enables us to see the spiritual truth of our Savior. And while it's true that the devil and his demons are trying to blind our spiritual eyes with the darkness of deception... It's also true that the Lord Jesus has come to provide us with the spiritual light that we need so that we might receive spiritual sight. Not only that, but he also calls every Christian to help others to escape uh, this spiritual state of blindness by reflecting the glory of his light. And this is precisely the point that Jesus was making in Matthew chapter 5. If you would look with me, we'll begin reading at verse 14. There, Jesus declares... You, speaking to the church, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Christian, listen. Those who embrace the light of the Lord Jesus Christ... We've not only been set free from our, from our own spiritual blindness, but the Lord then turns around and says, okay, now you function as the light of the world. We've been called, church, to shine the light of the Lord in the darkness of this world so that those who are still spiritually blind can see their need for Jesus Christ. In other words, we've been called, church, to illuminate the darkness of this world by preaching the gospel of grace. And in this way, the Lord will use us to open the eyes of those who are spiritually blind so that they can turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. If you've received the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
then let your light shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Now, this brings us to our second point, because listen, we not only receive spiritual sight by the light of the Lord, but we also receive spiritual sight by faith in the Lord. And with this as the focus, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles now to Mark chapter 10. You see, it's here in the 10th chapter of Mark's gospel account where we find another story about a day when Jesus restored the sight of a blind man named uh, Bartimaeus. And the story found here in Mark chapter 10, it actually helps us to see that those who trust in Jesus are able to receive their spiritual sight. Those who believe in Jesus will be empowered to be able to see spiritual truth. As a matter of fact, look with me here at Mark chapter 10. We'll begin reading at verse 46. Here Mark writes, Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. Now, here in this verse, we find this blind man named Bartimaeus. He's sitting on the side of the road, and he's begging. He's seeking charity from those who are willing to financially assist him. Kind of sounds like Austin, Texas. You know, everywhere we go, every time we pull up to a light, there's someone sitting there begging, sitting on the side of the road begging for money. And, and, and you know, the heart of love would lead us to reach into our wallet and pull out something to help. And, and, and you know, I, I get that, you know. But before we rush to provide a person on the side of the road with charitable gift, you know, I, I would remind you of something that Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. It's there where he declares, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Now, this is a biblical truth that, you know, sometimes we forget. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Or in other words, listen, our charitable gifts aren't to be given to those who are able to work, but choose not to. It's so important to grasp this, you know, because, because that compassionate heart leads us to just immediately give to someone that's asking, but if they're able to work and choose not to, be careful before you give them money. You might just be assisting them in their addiction. Listen, Bartimaeus here isn't sitting there begging because he was able to work but just chose not to. No, instead, he was not able to work. He couldn't work, and therefore he was begging. Imagine with me for a moment how difficult it would have been during the first century for those who were blind to earn a living. I'll remind you, ancient Israel was an agrarian society where most men earned a living by engaging in some sort of manual labor. And if you couldn't see what you were doing, you couldn't engage in this sort of manual labor. And with that being the case, Bartimaeus wasn't just waiting for a handout because he didn't want to work. He wanted to drink all night and sit on the corner every day and just have you pay for his alcohol. That's, that wasn't the situation at all. No one said he was sitting on the side of the road begging for money because this was the only way for this man to survive. Thankfully for him, there was one who had the power to heal him of his blindness. As a matter of fact, look with me here at Mark chapter 10. We'll pick up our study at verse 47 here. Mark writes, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Now here in these verses we find Mark, he's describing the faith of this blind man. And while it's true that he was unable to see Jesus walking down the road, it's also true that he was able to hear the conversation of those who were talking about the Lord. And you better believe that there were people there in that crowd who were, who were discussing the scriptures and the Messianic prophecies and wondering, could this possibly be the Messiah? And probably others were arguing against it, and there was probably debate happening. And I imagine that as this blind man hears this conversation and he hears the word of God and he hears about the possibility of the Messiah, that he cries out, Jesus, son of David. In light of this, I can't help but to remember something that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, where he declares faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want people to have faith in Jesus Christ, then share the word of God with them. 
because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Listen, as we talk about how incredible our Messiah is, there's going to be people who hear about the Messiah from us and, and, and hopefully they will trust in the Messiah and, and have faith in Jesus Christ. When blind Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was coming down the road, he immediately responded with faith. The evidence of his faith, well, it's found in this cry of help. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at Mark 10, verse 47. Here Mark writes, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Here in this verse, we find blind Bartimaeus. He's calling upon the son of David. This was a messianic term. This was a messianic title. He's saying, Jesus, Messiah, have mercy on me. That word mercy was well, translated from a Greek word which speaks of compassionate aid for the afflicted. He's saying, Jesus, Messiah, son of David, please be compassionate to me for I am afflicted. As we consider this cry for help, there should be no doubt in our minds that this blind man truly believed that Jesus had the power to heal his affliction. Totally believed it. Further evidence of his faith could be seen in the fact that he refused to submit to the cancel culture that tried to silence his faith. In order to explain what I mean, let's look again there at Mark chapter 10. I want to draw your attention back to verse 48 here. Mark tells us that many warned him to be quiet. Sounds like Twitter. Many warned him to be quiet. Talk, quit, quit crying out for Jesus. What did he do? He cried out all the more, son of David. Have mercy on me. This crowd was attempting to silence the cries of this man who had faith in Jesus Christ. They would, been, they would have been just fine if this man just remained blind for the rest of his life. And, and that's like the cancel culture. You know, they want to silence your faith. And they want to tell you, stop talking about Jesus. And when they do that, cry out all the more. Tell people more and more about Jesus Christ. Rather than giving in to the warnings of this majority, this blind man risked the retribution of the mob as he continued to cry out for the mercy of our Messiah. And as we consider his demonstration of faith, it's important for us to remember that the seed of faith won't properly grow in the hearts of those who are worried about the acceptance of others. The seed of faith will not properly grow in the hearts of those who are worried about the acceptance of others. When we allow the cares and the concerns of this world to, to choke out the seed of faith, our faith won't properly grow. In contrast to this, those who set aside their worries about the warnings of those who would silence our faith, those who set all that aside and simply seek the mercy of our Lord by faith, we grow in our faith, and as a result, we receive our spiritual sight. And with this in mind, let's pick up our study of Mark chapter 10. I want to draw your attention beginning there at verse 49, where we learn that Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus responding to the faith of this blind man. And he responds by calling the man to come forward from the crowd. This blind man is in this crowd. And Jesus says, come on out of that crowd and come to me. Without hesitation, Bartimaeus stepped forward in faith as he approached the one who could heal him. Now, we aren't told how this blind man was able to approach Jesus. Imagine being a blind man in a crowd, hearing Jesus call to you, and say, come to me, how would you navigate this? How, how would you get from where you are to where Jesus is if you're blind? It's possible that he has some friends there who, who were there to guide him. More than likely, the disciples were there. The disciples probably took him by the hand and, and led him out of the crowd to Jesus Christ. And in light of that example, we too should always be ready to lead those who are spiritually blind to Jesus. Those who are spiritually blind, they can't see their way to, to get to Jesus. 
They need a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ to bring them out of the crowd, to bring them out of the mob and, and to lead them to where Christ Jesus is. And with this as the goal, I want to remind you of something that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's there where he declares, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Christian, listen, the God of this age has blinded the eyes of those who reject the gospel message of grace. The unbelievers around us, their eyes have been blinded, and it's for this reason that the famous preacher Spurgeon once prayed this. He said, God, grant that no man here may die under the dreadful deprivation of light which is caused by satanic influence upon the minds of men who have not believed in Jesus. Those who have not yet believed in Jesus Christ, their mind is being blinded by the devil and his demons. And while uh, we have to pray for them as Spurgeon prayed for them, it's important for us uh, to be there ready to guide them as well. We should be praying for those who have been blinded by the deceptions of the devil, but we should also be ready to guide them to the Lord so that they might receive their spiritual sight by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, with this as the goal, let's continue to make our way through Mark chapter 10. I want to consider how Jesus healed this blind man. If you would look with me there, we'll begin reading at verse 51. Here Mark tells us that Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, to him, Rabboni, uh, that I may receive my sight, uh, Nadoi. Then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. And here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus inviting the blind man to present his request. He's saying, hey, let me know what your request is, right? And, and this reminds me of something that Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4. There, Paul declares, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your what? Your requests be made known to God. Christian, listen, those who come to Jesus by faith are invited, I would even say encouraged, to present our prayerful requests to the Lord. We shouldn't hesitate to bring our prayer requests to Jesus. And we can rejoice in knowing that he will always answer every prayer request according to the perfect will of God. Therefore, there's no reason for those who trust in Jesus to ever be anxious about anything. We don't need to be anxious. The Christian who prays about everything should be anxious about nothing. Why? Well, because God is going to answer those prayers according to his perfect will. Praise the Lord. Now, with this in mind, I want to continue to consider the way that the Lord responded to the prayer request of this blind man. Notice again there in verse 52. Here Jesus says to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, as we contemplate what Jesus here is saying, it's crucial for every Christian to understand that the Lord isn't providing a theological basis for believing in the doctrines of the faith healers. He's not suggesting here that the faith healers were right, that if you just have enough faith, you know, then you can just claim your healing. And just to be clear, the doctrine of the faith healers, well, it's based on the belief that those who just have enough faith, you know, if, you, if your faith is strong enough, you know, you can verbally command and claim the healing power of God. If you just have enough faith, you can just name it and claim it and have your way with God, right? Wrong. One problem with this point of view, well, it's seen in the lives of those who were raised from the dead by the power of Jesus Christ. Lazarus is just one of these examples. When Lazarus was dead and in the tomb, how much faith did he exercise before Jesus rose him up from the grave? The answer is zero. He had zero faith. He was dead. It wasn't by his faith that he was raised from the grave. How about the father who asked the Lord to heal his son by, by freeing his son from the demon that possessed him? This man confessed right up front that his faith was weak. He did this by declaring, Lord, I believe. 
help my unbelief. He's saying right up front, hey, I'm, I'm trying to believe you here, you know, but I'm kind of struggling with some unbelief too. You know, can you help me with that? You know, if the, the doctrines of the faith healers, you know, is correct, then the Lord Jesus should have responded to that man and said, well, work on your faith. And if you can just kind of, you know, muster up enough faith. No, we don't need to muster up enough faith. We just need mustard size, seed size faith, right? In light of these examples, it's important to understand that our healing isn't based on the quality of our faith, but rather the power of the one we have faith in. And even if we just have a little bit of faith, it's enough for us to, to, to come before Jesus and make our request to him known. With all that being the case, then we might ask, well, what did Jesus mean then when he told Bartimaeus that his faith had made him well? Well, in order to answer this question, it's important to remember that it was the faith of the blind man that led him to cry out for Jesus. It was the faith of the blind man that led him to ask the Lord to restore his sight. It was the faith of the blind man that led him to the one who had the power to heal him. Had he not had faith in Jesus Christ, he would have stayed in the crowd. He would have never come out and placed his faith in Jesus Christ and received by faith, you know, the, the restoration of his sight. And so, yeah, it was his faith inadvertently that, that led him to receive his sight. Why? Because it was faith that led him to the one who had the power to restore his sight. So we see then that Bartimaeus was healed, not because he had some sort of extraordinary measure of faith, but rather because his faith was in the one who had extraordinary power. And in similar fashion, the Lord Jesus is also able to restore the spiritual sight of those who will simply believe in him. The Lord confirms this incredible truth in John chapter 12. It's beginning at verse 44 where Jesus declares, he who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me and he who sees me and sees him who sent me. And I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Those who believe in Jesus will receive our spiritual sight. God the Father sent the Lord Jesus for this very purpose, to provide us with the spiritual light that we need so that every sinner can see our need for the salvation that only Jesus provides to those who trust in him. As we place our faith in Jesus, he then frees us from the darkness that blinds the eyes of every unbeliever. Not only that, but he also enables us to follow him as we walk in the spiritual light of the Lord. Now this brings us to our third and final point, because listen, we not only receive spiritual sight by the light of the Lord, and we not only receive spiritual sight by our faith in the Lord, but we also receive spiritual sight by the word of the Lord. And with this as the focus, let's turn in our Bibles now to Acts chapter 9. You see, it's here in the ninth chapter of Acts where we find Luke. He's recounting the conversion of a Pharisee named Saul. You might not know this, but it was a Pharisee named Saul who became an apostle named Paul. And as we consider the way that Saul the Pharisee became Paul the apostle, it's important for us to remember that Saul was first blinded by the light of the Lord's glory. And with this as the focus, let's consider Luke's account of this conversion. It's found in here in uh, Acts chapter 9. If you would look with me there beginning at verse 1. Here we read, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Now, according to Luke here, Paul the Apostle, he's initially known as a Pharisee named Saul, and we see here that Saul was standing in opposition to the disciples of Christ. The reason why? Well, it's due to the fact that Saul didn't believe in Jesus. Instead, he believed that Jesus was a false messiah. And he was determined to protect all the other Jews uh, in, in the Gentile world from this message that was being preached by the Christians. He dedicated himself to the persecution of Christian missionaries uh, who were going into the world with the goal of preaching the gospel message of Jesus Christ because he just, you know, in his mind was thinking that I'm going to stop people from being deceived by this message. And so he's making his way to Damascus. And, and on his way to Damascus, Saul found himself enveloped in the light of the Lord. 
With all this in mind, let's turn our attention now back to Acts chapter 9. Look with me there at verse 4. Here Luke writes, Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Now here in these verses, we find Saul the interrogator being interrogated by our Savior Jesus. It was at this moment on the road to Damascus that he found himself enveloped in the heavenly light of the Lord. He was on his way to go interrogate Christians. You know, he's going to pull out his light and shine it in their face. And where were you? And, but he found himself being interrogated as the light of the Lord was placed in his face. And the Lord says, why are you persecuting me? As he realized that he was standing in the glorious presence of the Lord, Saul immediately came to grips with the fact that Jesus is, in fact, the promised Messiah. It was at that moment when Saul submitted himself to our Savior Jesus. And with that in mind, let's continue to consider Luke's account of this conversion. Look with me again there at Acts chapter 9. We'll pick up at verse 7. Here we learn that the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Here in these verses, we find Luke describing the interesting juxtaposition that took place there on the road to Damascus. Saul there ended up losing his sense of sight as he looked into the glorious light of the Lord. And yet it was at the same point in time when the spiritual light of the Lord enabled Saul to see for the very first time. This was the very first time that Saul was able to see the truth of the fact that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. And I do find it interesting that he was left three days without sight. Three days. Anything significant about that? What do you think he was imagining during those three days, having known that the Lord Jesus was in the grave for three days before ascending uh, before rising and then finally ascending into heaven. Well, during that time without sight, I believe that the Lord was ministering to his heart and helping him to understand the truth. And, and it's, it, you know, Saul here, he, he's then provided with the ability to see through his spiritual eyes while being blinded, physically speaking. And while it's true that the Lord gave him the ability to now spiritually see, it's also true that the Lord then turned around on the third day and healed Paul of that physical blindness. As a matter of fact, look with me again here at Acts chapter 9. I want to pick up our study at verse 10. Here Luke writes, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord, he's directing this disciple. His name was Ananias. He's directing Ananias to go and lay hands on Saul so that Saul might receive the restoration of his physical sight. Now, listen, the, the Lord could have healed Saul without sending this saint. Remember, the Lord took away his physical sight without being there, right? He didn't send a, a disciple to go and lay hands on him when, when, all, when this whole thing went down. So, so, so why is it that the Lord now has to send uh, this saint named Ananias to go lay hands on Saul in order to restore his sight? Seems to me that the Lord wanted this brand new believer named Saul to understand the importance of the church. He wanted Saul to understand the importance of the assembly of believers. Rather than healing Saul from afar, the Lord instead sent a saint named Ananias to lay hands on him so that he could be healed. And, and so in this way, I think the Lord was helping him to understand the importance of the church. And then you'll, you'll see later on that Saul goes then out as Paul and starts planting churches everywhere, encouraging believers to assemble together. Well, not only that, but Ananias was also sent that Saul might uh, realize the importance of 
the vision that comes from the revelation of God's word. And with this in mind, let's turn our attention back to Acts chapter 9. If you would look with me there at verse 13, here Luke uh, uh, tells us that Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Now, here in these verses, we find Luke. He's recounting the way that the Lord used Ananias to restore the sense of sight to Saul. And not only that, but the Lord also used Ananias to show Saul important truths. The Lord used Ananias to show Saul how the Lord was planning to use him. I should point out that the word show which is found there in verse 16. It's translated from a Greek word, which was used in reference to a teaching that's been designed to demonstrate the truth that's being taught. So, so it's kind of a illustration. It's a revelation that helps you to understand something that's being taught. The same Greek word was also used in reference to a revelation, which would enable a person to see the prophetic plans of God. And so the Lord sent Ananias to go and reveal God's plan for Paul. The Lord was not only restoring Paul's sense of sight, but he was also providing him with a prophetic glimpse of Paul's future. Paul elaborates on this spiritual vision, which he received at this point in time. It's actually in Acts chapter 26, where we learn about the day when the Lord Jesus instructed him to rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I yet will reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to do what? To turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Here in these verses, we, we find the Lord Jesus. He, he helped Paul to actually see the plans that God had for him. He was helping Paul to understand what he was about to go and do. And in this way, we can see how the Lord actually provided Paul with spiritual sight according to the revelation of the, the word of God. Jesus was giving him a, a, a prophetic word so that Paul would understand where he was headed. The Lord presented Paul with the revelation of the word so that he could clearly see the prophetic plans that God had for him. And in response to this revelation, Paul then becomes the apostle to the Gentiles as he goes out and journeys through the Gentile world. And in this way, he helped restore the sight of those who are spiritually blind in the Gentile world. Not only that, but the Lord also used Paul to write more than 30% of the New Testament. You might not know that, but a third of the New Testament was penned by Paul according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, we too can now receive the spiritual light of God's word, which helps us to see God's plan for our life. If you wanna know what God's plan is for your life, then you need the light of God's word to illuminate the path before you. I like the way that the psalmist put it in the 119th Psalm. There he declares, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The believer who wants to see the Lord's plan for their life, we must use the word of God like a spiritual light. The word of God has been given to us so that we can illuminate the path before us, so that we can see and make sure that we are following the Lord Jesus Christ. I like the way that Peter put it in 2 Peter chapter 1. It's there where he declares, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. According to Peter, the Lord Jesus has confirmed for us the word of God. Through the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of our Savior, he has confirmed the truth of God's word. And now he's helping his audience to realize that the word of God now should be used like a light to illuminate the dark path before us. Imagine that for a moment. We are to use the word of God like a flashlight so that we can see God's plan for our lives. I'm sure we've all used a flashlight before. Maybe it was during a power outage at your house. You, know, you reach for the flashlight so that you can find your way to the house to turn the power back on. Or, or maybe you've been out camping. And you know, when the sun, the sun starts setting, you know, it gets dark. And as you're out camping, the chances are you brought a flashlight with you. And so you use the flashlight to illuminate the, the dark forest at night so that you can find your way back to, you know, wherever it is that you need to get to. We need that flashlight when things get dark so that we can see where we're going. And it's in a similar yet spiritual way that we need the word of God. We need the word of God to illuminate the path before us. The word of God is the flashlight that we need so that we can see where we're going. I'm sure we all recognize that we live in an extremely dark world, spiritually speaking. We live in an extremely dark world. What's even worse is that there are many spiritual pitfalls before us. There are many stumbling blocks that are before us, many things that, that we're going to spiritually trip over if we don't have the path before us illuminated. We're going to stumble into sin. We're going we're to fall away from the Lord if we don't light the path before our feet. Therefore, it's crucial for every Christian to not only gain sight from the Lord, but we need to uh, have the light of the word so that we can see the path before us. And it's the word of God that illuminates that path for us. Sadly, there are many in the church today who are stumbling their way through this world. They're stumbling back into sin. And the reason why is because they're trying to figure it out on their own. They're trying to, you know, use their, their thinking. They're, they're, they're trying to think their way through every decision, you know. And, and, and you know, when they, when they reach out for help, you know, they, they go to the Twitter sphere, you know, and they want to see what is everybody's opinion about this. And, and they want to hear, you know, the counsel of, of men. And then they wonder why they keep stumbling back into sin and why they can't seem to, to see clearly the path before them. And if this sounds like your situation, I encourage you to remember that it's God's word. God's word, not, not the opinions of, of the masses online, not the opinion of the counselor down the street. It's the word of God that provides us with the light that we need. God's word is the lamp for our feet and the light for our path. And we would do well to use it for that purpose. Now, as we begin to wrap up this study, it's important for us to remember that the Lord and the Lord alone is able to provide us with the spiritual sight that we need so that we can see God's plan and God's path for our life. Therefore, if you've been suffering from spiritual blindness, I encourage you to remember that our spiritual sight is restored by the light of the Lord. The light of the Lord is what will enable us to see. And, and our spiritual sight is restored by our faith in the Lord. We have to walk by faith with Jesus so that then we can walk in the light of the Lord. And finally, our spiritual sight is restored by the word of the Lord because it's the word of the Lord that illuminates the path before us. And so to sum it all up, our Savior is inviting us to walk by faith. And we are to walk by faith in the light of the Lord's truth. And as we do, Jesus has promised to help us to see God's will for our life as he continues to restore our spiritual sight.